Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy. I'm looking to see, I don't see the record button on. I'm pretty sure it is recording, but it's not showing it. That's weird. Oh, it's on. Okay. I'm Kathy L. Murphy, and I'm reporting live from my little cabin in the woods called Murphy's Law. And I have an old friend and a new friend here today, two authors that I'm going to be talking to today about their books. And I'm going to first introduce uh, Saborna. I'm gonna have her pronounce her last name because I'm still working on my Hindi and my Indian um, you know, uh, pronunciation. So Saborna, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're located. Okay, so my last name is Roy Chaudhry. Roy Chaudhry. Roy Chaudhry, yes. And okay. I live in um, Houston, Texas. And um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm connecting with you from Houston, Texas today. And so a fellow Texan, fellow Texan down in Houston, and we've got lots of chapters and members down there. So I hope they'll all be watching when I post this up on my uh, Kathy L. Murphy Big Book Love channel on YouTube. So anyway, we're here today with you. And you're a brand new author and you will be a um, book club selection for my 25th anniversary and the big launch of our Kathy L. Murphy Big Book Love. And do you have your book with you that you can show it? Sure. Give me one second. <laughs> Finish. Sure. It while she goes to get it. Yeah, I had them at my daughter's house. Everything here, everything here belongs to you. And there it is, everybody. It's so great. I can't even tell you how excited I am about this 25th list and all the authors that I've got coming up on it. And then we have our dear friend, Kathy Ramsberger, who is a two-time Pulpwood Queen uh, winner of our book awards. And she has been on a big tour of Greece, right? Yeah. Uh, I went to see my son who works in Eastern Europe and Spain. He teaches English and uh, we had a wonderful family gathering for a week. And then I went on to Paris where I attended a workshop with Lon Samantha Chang, who runs the Iowa Writers Workshop. And that was just Amazing. phenomenal. Yeah, um, so it was up to the last minute, <laughs> but I'm back and uh, I brought back a little something called, I call it Voldemort disease. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even give it a name, um, but uh, I'm over that now, just a little horse and uh, wonderful and so wonderful and such a treat to be here with both you ladies. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful writers. Uh-oh, I think we might have lost Kathy. Kathy, are you here? Yeah. What happens when this happens is that we just keep talking. Okay. So yeah. why don't I say how we know each other, Saborna? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. I want her to hear it too, but yeah. we're gonna we're gonna keep it rolling. Say that, Kathy, Let Kathy know. come back and I'll start over if we need yeah. to. It's it's it just been out for oh, there just she a is. second. Yeah. There she is. You guys disappeared. I stayed on. I have no idea what's happening today. Um, but anyway, Kathy, tell them you're at home, right, today. I'm at home. I'm absolutely yeah. at home. Very glad oh. to be at home. Okay. <laughs> do you have your two books handy there for I you? Do. I do. Um, so this was uh, the 2021. Yeah. Kathy mm -hmm. Pick. Yes. And this was uh, the 2023 Thousand International Swan Book of things. the Year. Very exciting. And I, you know, Nobody that I knew of, I did not know of Kathy when I picked her book or Soborna, but I was hearing great things about the authors. We got the books and I'm very proud of their accomplishments and all the, uh, you know, the accolades and reviews that you guys are getting for your book. So um, let's go start first with a little background because you two know each other. And I think it's very interesting authors that are 
uh, become best friends because they met in a particular way. I know Pat Conroy was one of my dearest friends and he introduced me to his best friends, Janice Owens and Doug Marlett, and they became good friends. And I'm finding that there's all these connections. So I want to hear about you two's connections. So who wants to begin? I would love to begin because okay. um, I... I know both sides, you know, I know the the pulpwood queen side and I know uh, how Sporn and I met. So, but feel free to chime in, either one of you. Mm -hmm. So it was 2010-ish, right, Saborno? Was it 2012? It was 2015. 2015. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. We met in New York City uh, at the Algonquian New York City uh, Pitch Fest. And I would be really remiss not to talk about our fearless leader there, novelist Susan Breen. I think she got all of us published eventually. I think every single one of us is published from that workshop. Yeah. Um, such a dynamic group of, of writers. Um, <clears throat> and so Saborna, almost immediately then, you were at a festival in Houston and uh, you were offered, uh, a, a, Johnny Bernhard was an agent then, and she offered to you a contract, and a New York City agent offered you a contract. I think she's still your agent. Um, and um, so it was a tough decision. I remember that. I remember your emails. <laughs> and uh, you finally went with the bigger agent in New York. But I, I also want to add that, you know, how much we enjoyed that uh, New York pitch conference we went to, right? Um, so really we wanted were, all of us. Yeah, 10 or 11 authors. And uh, we had to first practice the pitch with uh, Susan Breen. Oh. Remember, write and rewrite the pitch 15 times. It, it was just... That was a great guidance. By she fire. It was. You, you get was. like two minutes or three minutes in front of an editor from a major publishing house and you have to impress her within those three minutes. Okay, you cannot say one extra word and you have to leave the pitch with a question because if she's not intrigued and she doesn't want to know the ending, she will not talk to you again, right? Remember? Right. Yeah. I do remember, I and, and you got, I think everybody wanted your book and I had two, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the Borna's quality of writing and her ability to pitch which um, I have to say is not my absolute best strength. It's, I'm a fine pitcher. I usually get requests, but mm -hmm. this was big time, big deal from the publishers. Um, yeah, but they were all from publishing houses, Random House, Penguin, Harper College. You know? Wonderful, yeah. wonderful editors came, but I don't know what happened to them afterwards when we sent out the manuscript, you know, not many responded. <laughs> One of them was Jackie Weiss, who was... Um, um, you know, um, Outlander's editor. Yeah. Remember? Well, most, most publishing houses are, and, you know, are down to one editor. So they are overloaded with, I mean, when I think about how many books I get to read a year and I'm just running this international book club, but can you imagine somebody like Random House, how many they get? And it's, it's really hard, but I do look at every single book, but of course I read my authors that are members first, because to me, anybody that invests in my book club gets top priority. And it's not that you pay to be a read because I look at every book and sometimes I pick one that's not, they're not a member yet, but I will tell you, you guys are uh, the cream of the crop this year. And, um, I'm really excited about, Kathy, your new book coming out and everything. But you guys met there. You were complete strangers. And what do you think it was that made you bond? I think it was the similarity in our books. That was part of it. Um, and the other Let's part of it is that. that we Let's all bonded. We all yeah. bonded. It was, a, it was an intense week. Kathy was an extremely kind and generous soul. I could, I could just see the goodness, you know, that was coming out of her. And I knew that, you know, this Likewise. this person can become a lifelong friend. She has all those qualities. And oh, then she absolutely. that story of publishing that I will never forget. Because, you know, at that time, I had not, you know, seen the, the darker side of publishing that much. So I was not, you know, completely um, terrified of publishing. 
But Kathy told me, oh my God, Kathy told me that she wrote this book and she's been trying for about 20 years or so. No, uh, it wasn't. Well, maybe by 2015, it was, I wrote, mm -hmm. I'd been trying for a very long time with different books. Yeah. I wrote these two books in 02 and 03. And so it was a long time before I even got that far. Yeah. This is important to note because for people out there that are thinking about writing a book, mm -hmm. it does not happen overnight. In fact, it's probably the slowest. I think they're still publishing books the same way as they did when Charles Dickens' books were published. <laughs> but um, it's a slow process. And it and it's like you wait, wait, wait to go. I need this by tomorrow. And it drove me crazy because I like to, you know, plan things out and kind of pace myself. But, you know, we need an author to interview you by tomorrow to put up on our website. And I was like, who am I going to get? I mean, I have so many authors. And luckily I got Christopher Cook, who was in Prague at the time to do it. And he did it like that. But, you know, the wonderful thing about us, and now that you are on board with the international Kathy L. Murphy Big Book Love launch, is that all of us as authors, if we band together and hold hands, we have, there is um, power in numbers. And the more that we um, have that brand, that's why I really love it when you guys put it on your book. I have the new stamp for the 2025. Um, it really sends it home. And it's a proven fact that people buy books that have those awards on them and the stickers from the Oprah to the Reese to the whoever it may be uh, sticker. Uh, it's important that people know that you're reviewed and reviewed well. And then I'm also going to blurb everybody's book that I pick from now on. I can't review them on the online booksellers because I've been banned for some reason. I don't know why, but I can blurb them and I will. And I want to invite all the authors to blurb each other's books because I've seen how the blue sky chat writers and other you know, of these entities that work together and form these author bands, um, they get their books out there in a big way. So the more it's, there's power in numbers. So thank you for joining. And I'm so excited. Now you guys have known each other since 2015. It's almost, that's almost 10 years. Yeah. So how often do you guys talk to each other? Not really yeah. We, we uh, messaged for quite some time mm -hmm. and then we, I, I think maybe right when COVID started, we were kept, we would see each other's posts, yeah. but it, it, we got, just I got distracted. I'll, I'll ask Saborna how she got distracted if at all, because you have a young family. Yeah. Um, my kids were in college at the time um, and they came home, which was unexpected. Um, but um, I took that time to start my own podcast because nobody was getting into bookstores. And um, I met my agent for A Thousand Flying Things during that time. So um, I had to, you know, that there's the wait, 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 hurry up. I, that was what was going on for two years <laughs> with me. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> Um, editing my book at that time um, you know I did meet my agent in 2015 her name is Julie Stevenson and uh, she works uh, the agency name is MMQ Lit um, and she's wonderful and she uh, you know um, she really she was very enthusiastic about the book but then uh, around 2017 or 18 she told she read the you know revised draft and said you know Saborna the POV is not working and you have to change the POV, which meant, you know, going from omniscient POV to third person, close third person POV. Mm -hmm. And that kind of completely changed the structure of the book. So this was so huge and such a big ask, right? I and noticed that. Remember uh, when I said I noticed that yeah. the point of view? Oh, it's heartbreaking to hear these things, but it's it. People need to know that it's not an easy road. It's a it's it's like climb Mount Kilimanjaro practically to get to the top. You know, I but think uh, said climbing Mount Everest. That I yes. yeah. She said uh, this is like climbing Mount Everest, and I'm going to be your trainer, and I'm going to guide you through this. 
but it really was like climbing Mount Everest. And in the beginning, I was shattered, you know, when she said, change everything in the book, you know, make it, first of all, you have to make it, you know. Um, True, excuse me. Yeah, it's... it's Parul between Parul and Mohini, and no, you cannot have any other POV in there, right? Um, so, so I had to start from the beginning, almost, right? Rewrite the whole entire book. And that's why I was so depressed at that time and wasn't talking to anyone. <laughs> It's, it's really tough because when, you know, my book was, was in its third printing and my publisher took it out of print, they didn't realize that every new member is to read my book. It's a perpetual going to be read book. Yeah. And so I had to publish it myself. And luckily for me, Catherine Casey walked me through that process. But what happened was my agent in New York, her, she suffered a flood and she lost my dis with the manuscript in the flood and the copy that I had crashed on a computer so when I asked my publisher for the copy of my book they said sorry um that's our property you'll have to retype it and use a different font and so even though I provided the the you know the cover and the the little emblem of the tiara was my first tiara even though I provided all that stuff I had to go back and do the same thing I had to retype the entire first book all over again and it was clean I had two editor Julie Cantrell I had all these people look it over then when we sent it off to be published it still came back with errors and I was just and then finally I just I you know I just had to let it go so um you know, there's something to be said about, you know, uh, the books that used to be published never had a mistake. But today, it's almost virtually impossible not to have a next mistake, no matter how many times. I think the, my first book, 30 Revisions, how many? Kathy, are you there? Okay. I think she was about to ask how many revisions. Yeah, so I had to do many, many revisions for my book. I, I lost count on mine. I have... I had three editors, you know, starting with uh, Cecilia um, and she did minor editing. And then of course, Julie gave me revision notes. And then finally I had to go to Laura Chazen and Laura Chazen was like, you know, she's the editor of St. Martin's Press and she's fantastic development edit editor. And she looked at Julie's notes and she helped me. She guided me because I was, you know, I come from a science background. If you ask me to change, it was really, I mean, it's about promoting literacy. It was not <laughs> happy. You guys are published. Your books are beautiful. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, Kathy, can you hear us? So looks like Kathy is talking and we are talking on separate. Yeah, it went off for a second and I don't know why, because my internet's green. So uh, it, there must be some kind of weird thing in the atmosphere. Maybe it's that comet that's coming down that's the size of the Empire State Building. Have you heard about that? <laughs> we have a, a giant oh, comet going to pass the Earth. It's, it's a billion miles away, but we're going to see it. So um, you never know. But anyway, what is your similarities that um, you f have found in your stories? Well, I think that, so my favorite part of Saborna's new book, but I've read her first book as well. I've got to read it. I've got, I haven't, I haven't read it. it. It's wonderful. Um, is the multicultural aspects of it. And my, that's not my favorite part. My favorite, my favorite part is when Michael and, um, no, Mahini, right? Is that her name? Um, <clears throat> are getting to know each other. And I remember parts of that from the draft that I, I didn't see the whole draft. I just remember, I, I remember a relationship. I also remember you sitting in a New York pub and, and yeah. reading mine. Do you remember that? It was, it, that, yeah. it, it just warms my heart to remember that. Yeah. Um, and the reason it's my favorite part is because it, it so aptly describes all the assumptions people make about each other. Um, and he makes it of her and she makes it of him. And uh, I, I hope I've achieved a bit of that in my own books. Um, 
it's they're not communicating properly until they do right and then it's always too late yeah, so we have stereotypes mm -hmm. in our minds about other cultures right <laughs> yeah. all the stereotypes we have about you know like when whenever we see an american we think oh this is the Hollywood type of, you know, whatever we have seen in Hollywood movies, we try to put that on, uh, on an American. <laughs> and that's that really Americans crazy. do the same thing, right? We, right? we see a Bollywood film and that is India. Yeah. I'm not talking and about all of it's just really Mumbai. I mean, you know, that there's lots of other different film types and styles throughout. India is a huge country. And I, I've spent the past since COVID learning all about it. But, you know, what, is we we tend to learn from the very small sp space we're raised in the world uh, these preconceived notions of Americans or Indians or you know people from the you know upper Northeast you know and I find that the more you get out and travel and go you find more similarities mm -hmm. and you know there's a lot of good people. Uh, in this world that um, because of some entity within their country that did terrorism or like here we have David Koresh, who was the crazy Waco man who thought he was Jesus Christ's second coming. I mean, people think of Americans by even our presidents and it's not necessarily true. I was raised in Kansas. So I'm a long way from Hollywood, you know, it's the, you know, rolling hills and farmland and cattle and oil country. It's not anything like, you know, LA. So, um, and Houston is so different from East Texas where I live. I live in the woods and you hear you're in this, one of the largest cities in really probably in the country, one of the bigger ones. And um, yet I live in a town that, well, it's not even a town. We have 4,000 families that live here in this gated community, and it's in the country. So, and then, Kathy, you have where all the different places you've lived. But okay. that's the wonderful thing about when we go to read your books is because when we hear that person's voice and their story, we learn that we're not as different as we think we have the same wants and needs. So I, I your books are both out, do an outstanding job of explaining different cultures and people and places. What is the most important thing to you when you were telling your story? What was the number one thing that you wanted to get across in your, um, was it the setting? Was it the, the, the love story? Was it the, you know, the place? What, what, it, We'll start with you, Kathy. What um, What is it you want to get out on your last book? Oh, in my last book, I wanted to show um, people kept asking me about my humanitarian life like it was glitzy. So I would say that oh. was number one with that se with first book, second book. With the first book, I wanted to show that love and communication is the only way we're going to build bridges between cultures. Right. Absolutely. Okay, Saborna, what about you? So um, for, for my second book, Everything Here Belongs to You, um, I think the idea of the book came to me long ago. Uh, you know, 9-11 had just happened, and there was this mounting Islamophobia uh, in, in U.S., and, you know, mosques were being burnt all around, and uh, Horrible. Uh, women were very, very scared. They could not use their minority symbols. They could not step outside the house. Many people got killed in the subways, you know. And this was absolutely heartbreaking for me. I, I couldn't tolerate it. I, I realized that, you know, um, because of something very, very, very few people had done, the whole community was getting the blame, right? The, the Muslims, if anything, were themselves the victims, right? Um, they were getting all this bad name because of something, some some teeny tiny portion uh, of right. what they had done, right? So um, I I wanted to address this, and I wanted to address you know the the Muslim American tension. Um, I know it's a taboo topic, but I wanted to pick it up, and I wanted to show. Mine too. Uh, huh? It's mine too. It's not that taboo, by the way. I don't. It's think. not anymore. I think it's finally opening up, but uh, goodness, uh, 
Uh, thank goodness. But have you guys seen the Shah Rukh Khan movie, My Name is Khan? Have you seen it? I have seen I it. I think if everybody would watch that movie every 9-11, it's kind of like every Christmas we watch It's a Wonderful Life. Everybody needs to watch My Name is Khan because that's a story about a Hindu man, a, a Hindi woman hairdresser who falls in love with a Muslim beauty supply salesman in California and what happens to them because they're of um you know it happened 9-11 happened and people just freaked out you know they did do you know that um I live on um that we have a corridor that goes down to Houston on 59 highway and I would be driving to Marshall which is 15 minutes away and I'd see taxi cabs with Chicago license, Illinois license plates passing me. And I couldn't figure out what taxis were doing driving. And what it was is um, Muslim families couldn't abort on planes because they were, you know, checked so and treated so badly that they would hire a taxi to take them to their family in Houston and back and forth. And I thought, you know, that's, isn't that just, it's just horrific to think about that. And, and now the country is in this whole thing about get rid of all immigrants. Well, we're all immigrants. I hate to tell people that we all come from somewhere else, unless you're Native <laughs> American Indian. I mean, I'm come on people. But, uh, but we have to be, I mean, our whole country was built upon, give me your tired, your, your poor, your, you know, and all the people struggling to be free. I, I, it just, it's on the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's, uh, so when we read books like both of yours, then we have a better understanding. And it's not done in a way that um, is preachy or educational. It's done in a storytelling. The best, the best learning comes from storytelling. Yeah. In any religion, it's your storytelling that tells your the you know the muslim faith or the hindi faith or the you know the christian jewish you know whatever faith you may be but um um how have you you've been going out there and and how has the reception been as you've been going out with your book to do it, book signs it's been very good because i go to all sorts of book festivals i um I even go to farmer's market, you know, I go to bookstores and I I tell them that all I do is I call people and I tell them the plot and their eyes pop up out, you know, they, their eyes become bigger and they, they, they get the book right away. It's the plot, you know, the plot that we wrote in New York uh, pitch conference is yeah. the same thing. I give that same pitch to these people and immediately they want to know the end of this ending of the story, which I wouldn't tell them. And, and I, I always say, you know, to know the ending, you have to get uh, this book. And of course, you know, when you give the pitch, uh, in the beginning, they look at you suspiciously thinking that, you know, you if you're talking about a taboo topic about, you know, Muslim and uh, American relationship, maybe it's a biased book, right? That's the first thought that comes to their mind. And they look at me very suspiciously. And then I tell them, you know, why I wrote the book and uh, that, you know, that I wanted to, I, I wrote the book very respectfully, you know, I respect both the cultures and I bring out the tension between the cultures, but I also show, you know, why people do bad things by revealing their backstory and where they're coming from. Okay, so I show that it is it's inside important. all of us, you know, there is some kind of bias and prejudice and hatred inside of us that ultimately pushes people to do bad things. But all these characters, they're coming from a place where you can understand completely why they're doing what they're doing. And ultimately, even though no one in my book is doing anything good, they're not good characters, you are going to feel sympathy for them and you are going to understand them. And perhaps something inside you will change and you will be more sympathetic towards them next time you meet them. That's the key. Yeah. So that's Is what I do uh, in all, all of my uh, book fairs and uh, book festivals, wherever I go, I, I try to bring, I, I try to make people understand, you know, how, how their own um, uh, own indifference or unawareness is, is creating this huge uh, problem in the society that can lead us all to a, a great devastation. It's Kathy, freeze up.
Kathy, are you there? Uh -oh. Network bandwidth for some reason. I, if you get a chance to read either one of these to the books early so that everybody can give them for. Ready to go. Okay. Yeah, you guys keep going in and out, but my Wi-Fi is working fine, so I don't know what's going on. It's it's just uh, <laughs> strange. <laughs> but I was telling everybody that it's important that you read the books, and I'll be announcing all the books this fall so that people can get them early to read during the holiday season of wherever they may be in the world. And then I'm going to be doing more interviews with authors uh, for their books and uh, also doing lots of pairings like the two of you. Now, in any other circumstances, would have you ever met each other? Can you think? Well, I feel I, there's a Chinese proverb that says that there's a red thread that connects you and your daughter and any family member or anyone that is supposed to be special in your life. I think that red thread was between all three of us. But, oh yes, but it took a whole lot of doing for Saborna to get to New York City from Houston and me yeah. to get from DC to New York and to have the same workshop leader. I mean, there was a whole lot of planning up yeah. there that went into that. Um, so no, I don't think we would have Saborna to you, although maybe online, but it wouldn't have been the same thing as meeting in person. Meeting in well, person. you might have no. met. You might have met if I both picked your books at you know a conference or something. But mm -hmm. I do feel like pay attention to the people that are put in your path because that is part of your journey. And I I probably pay too much attention to who put, is put in my path because I put a lot of significant significance on even people I meet daily. Because I think, well, that was an interesting story. I met them for a reason. What might that be? And I think everybody has a story. And I do want to read your first book, uh, Saborna, because um, uh, when I invest in an author, I want to know about all their full body of work because I can see these trans. You know, I think about John Grisham. His first book came out of Time to Kill. It wasn't big four bookstores had a book signing for him and he always went back there because they gave that to him. But it wasn't until he sold the movie rights and he became famous for some other books that that book became famous. Same thing with Lisa Wingate. You know, her, her book, uh, she's one of our authors and she wrote, um, you know, Tending Roses. And that book was her first book. But 30 books later, she finally broke the million dollar glass ceiling and sold, you know, over a million books. And uh, Jamie Ford's over two million now. And he uh, and I have to share this again because this is amazing to me. Uh, he had a workshop in a chateau in France, a castle. And three of my Pulpit Queen authors and book club members went. It was Jeffrey Matthews and Lawrence, Lawrence Matthews and uh, Holly Hart Shirley and um, Sarah Dahlman all went and they FaceTimed me live. And I took it because it was Jamie Ford. It was live on FaceTime and I was in my pajamas. Because <laughs> 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 it was late at night. For them, but for me, it was during like early morning and I, I work at home in paint clothes and pajamas and I go, well, I guess everybody really knows me now because here I am in my, you know, whatever pajamas I have. Oh, your pajamas are elegant. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> She's whatever. Awesome. It's yeah. just, it's just uh, clothing, you know, uh, but I love the stories behind the stories. And I think that the, your friendship, I hope it goes on forever and we can celebrate both of you as you rise to the occasion and you eventually get to where you're going. Um, all the authors that I pick, I, my highest standard is To Kill a Mockingbird. That's my favorite book of all time by uh, Harper uh, Lee. And I, Everybody says that they go, well, that's not, you know, Marilyn Simon Rothstein writes hilarious stories, you know, make me laugh aloud. And they go, that's nothing like To Kill a Mockingbird. I go, you know, a book that can make you laugh is harder than a book that'll make you cry.
a, a book that's telling a story about uh, somebody who comes from somewhere else that uh, we know nothing about. I met a woman yesterday in the store where I work and she was from Albania. Albania. And so we had a whole conversation. How did you get to Tyler, Texas? And it was fascinating. Everybody has a story and our book club is all about connecting readers to our stories. So for anybody out there listening, if you have a book like these two, get them to me, go to the www.thepulpitqueens.com website. Authors join here. My address is there. Send me a copy. We're going to have a whole new website next year because the Pulpit Queens are going into hiatus and the Kathy Elmer, it's time to put a name on my book club and it's mine. I read the books, I pick the books and I want people to know that um, this didn't happen overnight. I It all happened because librarians and teachers influenced me so greatly when I was a child that reading was important and lifelong learning was important, which let's talk about that. What about you? What was it that got you started reading and writing? What was the biggest... Um, encourager who was the biggest encourager for each of you for me it was my mother my mother was a teacher oh there you go my mother wanted to write so there was a little bit of pushiness there i have to say but it was good pushy um it's all right and that got me reading i mean i was reading it too or, wow well little tiny board books oh don't go <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly because I was two, but I remember there was one about poodles. Um, poodles. That um, I don't remember the name of it at all, but my. Well, they have I, a poodle in Go Dog Go. So that's one of my favorite ones I used to read. Yeah. And then I wanted a shout out to the teacher that probably made me realize I could write, and that was Mrs. Covey, my fifth grade teacher. Fifth um, grade teachers are important. She made us write a story every week of the school year and i did it and i fell in love how about you saborna it's great that you realized so early that you could write i mean for me it was a long journey um i always loved to read i mean in our school at that time you know people did not watch that much television and you know um radio and television were not that popular it was mostly for me books because, you know, I would get a whole bunch of books from my friends, I would finish them, and then I would return them, you know, we exchange books. So they got my books, I got their books, you know, every day in my school bag, I would hide some books. Uh, I went to a Catholic school, so our, our backpacks were checked, you know, so we could not have any romantic books there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Harlequin romance, no, no, not allowed, you know, because... Uh, yeah, that that uh, our sisters or you know the nuns would catch them anyway. But we still sneaked in books and we exchanged books and we kept on reading. And I absolutely loved reading, but never thought of myself as a writer ever. So then I came uh, to US when I was 18 years old, and I started to read more of these Indian books. You know, if I, if by Indian authors because I missed home. You know. Yeah. I read yeah. Chuk Palaheri, I read Rohintan Mystery, I read Amitav Ghosh, all of this, you know, because they reminded me uh, of, you know, they brought back the smell of India to me. They brought back, you know, the memories of the streets and the alleys and the people and everything I left behind, you know. So I, cl I was clinging on to these books, you know, they, they, they were my survival tool. So I read a whole bunch of literature then and I admired all these authors and never thought in my life you know, that I would write one day, <laughs> you know, and, and, and actually get to meet some of them in real life, you know, that, that thought never crossed my mind. Because I came as a chemistry student, I, I did a, a bachelor's and two masters in chemistry, I wanted to be a chemistry professor, you know, that I would actually become a writer never yeah, occurred to me. Then I, sorry, I was on driving. Con, car driving reason. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, well, what was a, do you remember a book? Do you remember a book from that time or era, era that stuck in your mind that you loved reading? So, um, uh, Rohinton Mystery is my favorite uh, author, and I, I wrote I, I read his book around that time. Wow. And uh, uh, several books. Um, oh, what are the names of them? Anyway. Um, 
But you know, the thing about Rohindran Mystery is he has so much empathy for really unremarkable people, you know, street people like uh, a barber or uh, a tailor or, you know, a beggar and the way he describes them. And I think no one can understand the, uh, the politics and the culture and the society of India uh, more than him. And he writes with such empathy and such power. Um, yeah, the best book I read send uh, was- me, Send Find me an email of how, how to spell that and I'll put it in the copy um, of for the, you know, when I put up the recorded thing. I would love, I think that's something I'd like to do is if you could send me one or two authors and their books that I'm going to add that to add, because I think, you know, somebody said, when I go to somebody's home, it tells you a lot about their character. And I go, you know what I look at when I go to somebody's home? Their libraries. Look at Kathy's behind you. Yeah. I look at <laughs> what they're reading and you can find out volumes about a person by what they read. So yeah. Kathy, you do the same. Can you think of one or two? A yeah. Fine Balance is, uh, is his most famous book. And uh, I remember like um, he had only sold 60,000 copies of that book, Fine Balance. And then he went to the Oprah show. And the next oh. the number that he came out was 600,000. So oh. he actually sold 600 copies of his book. <laughs> yeah, that's a awesome. from the Oprah show. Yeah, <laughs> Oprah's pretty powerful. So, uh, we know how much she's done for literature here, really all over the world. So yeah. what about you, Kathy? What's a book or two? So I've got some from when I was really little, but the ones people will probably remember are... Um, um, crazy mixed up files on my of, of Mrs. Basil. Basil. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another would be um, um, the Narnia books, which were right oh. around fifth and sixth grade that I was reading those. Um, yes, Lewis, I love them. The, I, I, I know you were Nancy Drew, Kathy. I was yep. Trixie Belden. <laughs> There's a bit of competition going on between those two heroines. Oh, I know. It's kind of um, like the boxcar children and the Bobsy twins, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really true. Um, yeah. And then the When You Were it's There true. books, I remember. No, I was there. Do you remember those? Yeah. Wow. I, I like to read biographies and autobiographies of famous people when I was a little kid, too. People's real stories have always fascinated me. I always pick a lot of autobiographies and memoirs and biographies because uh, I've got one on our list this year. Uh, Paulina Poroskova has got a new book uh, that has come out that I am in love with. And uh, she is the she was a, uh, an international supermodel. Uh, was on Sports Illustrated, but she all she really wanted to do in her life was be a librarian. But her mother put her on a plane and she became a model in Paris. And, um, you know, her stories are, and what amazes me is, you know, she's Czech. So her, the languages she speaks is Swiss, Czech, French, and English. And I think English was her fourth language, but the books are written in English. How do you do that? I mean, I just think it's amazing that, you know, you come from another country and then you write a, a book in English. I just took 12 hours of French. There's no way I could write a book in French. No way. Because there's so much subtlety in the way they have a different way of thinking and their humor is hard for me to I always understand. Said that I understood a French joke. And I mean, I lived in Geneva for five years. If and I you, ever understood a French joke and got the punchline, I would be fluent. And I never got there. <laughs> no, I, you know, my daughter just got back from Paris and she said, I should have studied more. And, you know, she worked really hard to, to be conversational when she went. But it, you have to immerse yourself like you did, Sabrina, when you came at 18 and you went to university when you came here. Yes. When you first came here. Yeah. Yeah. Indians is a, is a little different. I mean, from from the Czech girl that you're talking about, she probably mm -hmm. didn't have, have English in school. She did have it but, in school. But for Indians, you know, because we were under. Okay, okay. 
um, because the British came to India 200 years ago and, you know, we have, uh, they have really good English medium schools behind, right? And so uh, those of us who uh, got to, uh, you know, were fortunate enough to go to an English medium school, uh, we did get to learn from, from a very young age. So um, I'm going to say it has been my second language all my life. So uh, cannot, cannot. I just wish we had foreign language in grade school. I do. I, I think it's a mandatory thing, but you know, English it's is people supposed from to... those countries because if you learn French from somebody in North Carolina, it's not the same French. It's just no, not. no, 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 no. I I'm very aware of that. I had a Belgian teacher once for French, and I never could understand her at all. But I have French people tell me they can't understand Belgium. But it's just like you know, Southerners and Northerners. Or, you know, we have different accents and ways of talking. So, but we can all learn from the sharing and translation of the stories. And now with Google Translate, you can take a picture of a page and it translates it. I mean, right. it may not be perfect, but you can get it. So, and I've watched enough Indian films now that I feel like I know the language, but I can't speak it. I, but I do understand because there's words that you pick up, you know, you just automatically understand that. So do you speak more than one language, Kathy? I, I, I'm semi-fluent in French. I, yeah. I read it and write it and I speak it okay. If I had stayed there, I would be fluent by now for sure. Um, I speak Spanish. Um, it's halting at times. I understand everything, yeah. but I don't necessarily always respond appropriately. Um, I try to learn a little Mandarin. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> do you speak both English and um, now you're Muslim? Do you speak Hindi or do you speak? Um, there's other types of Hindi. Uh, I'm learning, you know, there's like 565 different dialects. So, okay, what... I think I'm not Muslim, by the way. <laughs> so... Oh, you're not Muslim. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're I'm Hindu. Hindu. Oh, yeah. yeah, Hindu. Hindu. Okay. Okay. Actually, okay. I, don't, I don't believe in any any religion, so I don't have a religion. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, but... you know, the more I know, the less I know. I'm open to any uh, learning because I fell in love with Mahatmarat when I was during COVID, I watched all the 2013 series and I have, I see so sim, so many similarities between the stories of that and our own Christian Jesus stories. And I, I find it fascinating. Um, I, I just can't wait to go to India. I want to learn more. And unfortunately it's hard to find any place where you can study it here in Texas. I haven't found any place where you can take, uh, learn the language or learn the history, or uh, I really were rallied hard to see if we could get another professor that teach, you know, from a different mindset than the Western culture. But uh, we do, you know, it's just, it's, it's, the world needs to be more open. So anyway, it's fascinating. So, well, you know, what is some words of advice to new authors out there that you would tell them um, that you would like to share that would make them understand you, you don't give up, stay in for the long haul? What What is some advice you would like to share? First of all, I would um, tell beginning authors that, you know, um, writing a novel is a huge commitment. It is, it is like we were discussing, it is like climbing Mount Everest, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you are going to uh, do that, if you're going to take up something so difficult and so uh, such a long journey, um, you have to be very, very passionate about that, that topic. So you definitely want to choose a topic that, um, that you feel very passionately about, maybe angry about, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, you're in love with that topic. If you don't do that, then you won't be able to finish your novel because you it's such a such a difficult, hard road that ultimately you will lose interest and you will drop the novel and you will not finish it. So that's my advice to uh, authors that if you are starting a book, make sure that you really, really care for the subject area. 
A lot of people think you need to write for trends, and I disagree wholeheartedly. I think if you've got a story that just won't go away, that's the one you need to write. Yeah. And, I, I uh, believe, like, the characters are up there somewhere in the cloud, right? And they are waiting for a, a human companion, right? So if, if they choose you uh, to write this story, you should feel very honored that they chose you, but they do come to you and ask you to tell their story. Um, so, you know, you were meant to tell their story and that's why you are here. I, I know it sounds uh, strange, but- No, I think it makes perfect sense. Don't you, Kathy? Yeah. I totally do. I totally do. Whenever I sit down with somebody who wants me to edit their book before I decide whether I will or not, I ask them their why. And so that's exactly what you're saying, Saborna. Yeah, yeah. You have to be uh, sure that you're not going to back down. Otherwise, you will. Because there's, there's so many distractions, so many naysayers, um, so many judgmental people that say, what, what do you mean you haven't published it yet? <laughs> um, oh, authors gosh. should doubt themselves, right? Immediately you start to doubt your ability and, uh, you know, that do, can I do such a big project? Can I really finish this? Or can I really write this way? You know, are people I don't think you ever that? did. And neither so did many that. questions. Yeah. I don't think you ever doubted your ability, Saborna. I think maybe you might have. <laughs> I, don't think. I think we, I think we all, I think everybody, no matter how famous you are, you do have some self doubts because it's, it's because people question you and well, what makes you qualified to tell this story or whatever? But I go, well, all I've got to say is anybody that can finish a book and get it published uh, deserves to be read because the amount of time and effort and hard work and diligence that went into writing that story. There is a book for every person. It may not always be for you, but it might be the book that turns somebody on to reading. So that's why I try to pick as many genres as I possibly can. Fiction, nonfiction, mystery, thriller, you know, um, adventure, romance. I try to pick every type of genre and because I've also found that some of the best books I've ever read were out of my normal reading habit, yeah. you know, so, and I, but I do feel like the, my book club, the international public Queens now going to Kathy L. Murphy. I always have been picking international stories because I've always been fashion, fascinated by other cultures and people. And um, I really hope that trend picks up because just reading the books about people that are from where you're from is familiar, but I don't know if you always learn it. You may have a good feeling and nostalgia, but I think we need to be challenge ourselves a little bit more and read things that we wouldn't normally read. So that's why I pick what I do. And I fight hard. I will not be censored. I've had a lot of people question books that I've picked and, um, it's always satisfying when they win the Pulitzer or the a National Book Award after I've been given a lot of grief about uh, why did you well, pick that you book? Were the the well, for me. You were the start for me. I've got all kinds of awards for the second book and you were the first. Well, I, I thank you for that, but I feel like I'm just the person to give you guys the little push. I'm not taking credit for any of your talents. I just think that there's nobody out there that's really championing international authors. Or, and, and when I say that, I don't mean you have to be from another country. I mean, you have to be telling a story that's set somewhere that's not where you live, you know? Uh, let's and become more of a global world. I, I want to just get this in because it's really important to me. They say, write what you know. I did right. write what I knew. I, I fictionalized it, but I've, I, I lived some certain scenes in both books. Um, but if I spent half the time that I do justifying why I was the person to write my books, instead of just reading the pages or telling the plot, it would be selling like hotcakes. So I, I think that as readers, we all have to realize that people aren't writing a story, a good quality story, like the books you choose, Kathy. 
on a whim. We didn't say, oh, well, I'm just going to write about this. And I've never been there and I've never known the people. And uh, so I just wanted to say that because it's so important for all international authors today. Um, they are the hope of our world. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you get to know other cultures through books, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as uh, Kathy, I just wanted to say that, um, yes, I'm not Muslim. So yeah. uh, growing up in India um, as a Hindu girl, I did not mm -hmm. have any Muslim friends. So yeah. you must have you uh, gotten that vibe from my book that in Hindu families, no. they don't let. No, I mean, no. What I mean is yeah. in, in, in Hindu uh, families in India, they don't they don't have Muslim maids or they don't want Muslim friends, right? So there is a lot of tension between these two cultures. So when I wrote this book about Muslims, I had to do a lot of research. So I went to the Muslim part of the town. Uh, there's a place called Park Circus in Kolkata. And every day I used to walk around that area and I used to go inside the mosque, the, the khangas and the dargahs, and I would stop by and I would buy rose water and I would buy prayer beads and their books, you know. Uh, I would actually, I visit, visited a Muslim family, you know, a lower middle class Muslim family. And I said, is it okay if I spend the day with you? And then um, they invited me. They're very warm and loving. And they, they, I cooked with them. I ate with them. You know, they kind of put a huge plate in the center uh, mm -hmm. They, they actually eat on um, on the bed, you know, they that becomes their table. So, and they would eat, they, they would put a huge plate, steel plate in the center, and everyone would sit, sit around that plate and everyone would take a small bite. Okay, so they would take the roti and they would dip it into the curry and they would take a bite. So I did that with them. I ate with them. Later, I prayed with them. So I did all the, you know, prayer stuff, the, the sitting down, the, the posture, you know, um, the bowing and the prostrating, all of those things I did did with them. And later on, these women, they invited me to go to a mazar. A mazar is a, you know, a burial place um, for their saints. So I went to the mazar with them. I covered my head. I did the voodoo. Voodoo is, you know, you get some water from a fountain and you wash your face and hands. And then I sat with them during the prayer ritual. You know, the, the men were inside the room. The women were in the corridor. I sat with them. I, I observed everything. And then I used all this experience uh, from, you know, and I, you feel like they have touched you. They have given you their blessing. And then you I, I channeled all this into the book. And till, till I had finished the final draft, I have not shown it to a Muslim friend. Okay. So oh. finally, after I finished, it was completely polished and ready to go you know, almost get ready to get printed. I shared it with a Muslim friend of mine and I was terrified because, you know, uh, what if he finds mistakes in it and he says, you don't know our culture, what will I do? But then he said, you must have some help from someone, you know, how did you know so much? <laughs> so it was mainly research and even internet research helped me. But I also, that's, that's convinced me that, you know, that Parul probably wanted me to write this story. Otherwise, how did I know so much about Muslim culture? How did she come inside of me? You know? So I, I think that's what I want to do when I go to any country is I want to go meet all the different people of all the different factions. You know, I've always had Jewish friends and Catholic friends. I was raised Christian. But now I have a, a totally different view on... Um, now that I see the similarities in the stories and everything, I go, I try to look at the bigger picture and I go, instead of, you know, we need to learn. And my first husband was Muslim. Uh, we met, he was my, he was my math tutor for chemistry in college. And um, so I learned a lot about it, but he didn't practice his own faith in the United States. He went to church with me and, but I tried to learn as much as I could and got a, you know, a, a copy of the Quran, and I learned a few words, but as with anybody from every, any other country, cause I've had three foreign exchange students, they all don't want to speak their language. They want to learn English. So everybody always, even the international clubs I've been in, everybody wants to speak English. And I go, but I'd like to learn <laughs> a few words in Hindi. I, I mean, I don't, I'm going to go over there. I'm just going to be 
blank. I try to learn as much as I can, but, um, but anyway, um, hopefully I'll be going with some people that I know so that, that, that if I get in a bind, they can help me. I mean, I'm going to kind of stand out. I don't look like, a. let me know, know maybe and I'll go with you. Well, I, I would <laughs> love that. I would absolutely love that. And I know I was talking to my from Madhuri, who is a uh, trained classical Indian singer. She just got back from India. I don't know if you saw the post. And Vinay Rao. I've got all these friends. And I. my biggest fantasy is that we take a Kathy L. Murphy big book trip together and yeah. all go yeah. and then do book signings and go into people's homes and mosques and, and all the different festivals like Holly and and uh you know diwali i i just i i just yearn for that so much in my lifetime i think i've got so much i've got to do and i've got so much time but it is a plan i will tell you i will be letting you know but and and i know how much you like to travel too kathy i mean greece is if i if i go back to greece i'm going to corfu because i i don't know if you've ever heard of the durells of corfu but I read all their books. It was a family that, that came about. from England to live there. And they were very avant-garde. And they all became famous in their own. One became a writer. One became a naturalist. And fabulous. They're on PBS. It's on PBS. The Corel, the um, the Corels of Corfu. Durells of Corfu. But anyway... That is my plan is to get this next book out and say, okay, I want to go here. Who wants to go with me? And we'll figure it out. And so can you think of anything more delightful in life than getting together with all your author friends and traveling like Jamie Ford did when they all went to France? They had, they all bonded for life on that two week uh, writing trip. So if you can go to writers conference it will definitely help you in publishing world. Go to as many as you possibly can. I sure did. And thank you guys so much for this. We'll talk more. This is not, this is just the beginning. I want to do lots of these. So uh, I'm going to have to do them on Sundays because that's the only day I'm not in school or I'm working, but I look forward to them so much. And it's so great to talk to you in person. Any last words you'd like to share with our audience today? Kathy, you go first. Oh, well, I just look at all the synchronicities between the writers I know, uh, Saborna in particular. Um, and um, you never know where something's going to lead when you meet another writer. And I would have never imagined any of this. Um, Saborna led me to Johnny. Johnny led, led me to Kathleen Rogers. Kathleen... Rogers led me to Joy Ross Davis. I mean, and it was all around you, Kathy. I mean, all of it. You, you were there even when you weren't. Um, and so I just want to have a shout out to literary citizenship, literary sisterhood and the connections that and the bridges that are there, even if we don't know they're there all the time. And um if you if you help others and you believe in your books, you believe in yourself and stay persistent, you're going to get where you need to go. Yeah, and that's right. The universe not, will make it's it not an easy you. road. But <laughs> you're it, it's with worthy. <laughs> um, but yeah, Kathy, the, the most surprising thing for me was uh, that we all put in our books into that competition, the American Literary Fest, right? Was it? No, International Literary Fest. What, which one was that, Kathy? The International Book Award. Um, International Book Award. Called, but it is by the Literary Festival. It is yeah. sponsored by them. So recently we all put our books there. And you have such a critical literary eye that you the books that you picked were the winners. Yeah. So, so strange that when I saw the winners in the multicultural category, all three authors belong to your club. So it was me and then Kathy and then Anju Gatani. Anja, Anja oh, and have you got to meet her yet? Because Anju would love to meet you. And she's- yes, I um, talked to her on the phone. I congratulate great. her. 
So it was so strange that I don't know, thousands and thousands of books go into these competitions, right? They're very uh, well promoted all over the internet and lots of people apply. But the top three books were all your book club books. So I don't know how you did it. You know, what magic. <laughs> how did that happen? How did she do that? That was amazing. I don't know. Who did that? Huh? I didn't do did it. Did you do that? No. no. Who put the fireworks behind me? Was it me? <laughs> I'm telling you, there's, uh, yeah, there are things that we see and there are things that we don't <laughs> did see. Did you see that? <laughs> yes, we did. And now How did that happen? Okay. I don't know. I thought you were doing it. <laughs> no. All I did was go like this. Do you think it'll happen again? <gasps> did you guys know that? We learned something new. So when you go on another Figure podcast, out all the gestures and turn your thumbs up. Do you up. see I'm doing it? It's not happening to me. It must just be with the leader. The person uh, that is the craziest thing. thing I've ever seen. Oh my gosh, you guys, that just made my fourth of July, which is this coming week. So God bless America. How wild is that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this was very special to me and I will get this downloaded today and get it put up before I head back to, uh, I have to go back to work tomorrow and Tyler and I headed back to see my daughter coming back from Disney world. So you guys have a wonderful time. We'll check in in place. And if I can get a copy of that first book, I would love to read it. Kathy, how's your, your next book coming? It's coming thanks to this workshop. <laughs> oh, listen, mine, I'm working on two children's books and the sequel to my memoir and working full time and going to graduate school. So, but you know what? This is what I've given to myself. And remember this it's your time. So stay focused, keep on the, the journey. But when it's ready, it'll be ready. Don't beat yourself up if you can't get it done in six months or a year because it may not be done but when it's done it'll be done and then everybody will have the story so you just remember that too kathy when it's done it's done and we'll be waiting for it and we'll be writing for your first book too but show your books again to everybody out there and all i can say is this fourth of july you need to read these books <laughs> I can't believe that. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen I happen. Wanna, I want to put in a plug for this book too. Um, yeah. It's yours. And oh. if you want to hear what Pulp Book Queen, read what Pulp Book Queens and Kathy L. Murphy can do for other writers, read this book. Wow. It's a collection of Pulp Book Queens over the years. Um, and it was published the year that I came to Texas. So and what? Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I give that books out to a lot of my friends from other countries. One of my friends was going back to Pakistan and I gave him a copy to read on the plane. And he said, Oh, my children are going to know all about you. You know, when I, when they grow up, Kathy, and what you've done to promote literacy, but I really, and I gave him another, I had a copy of big lucky. I wanted him to read about, you know, uh, the power of winning. If you haven't read, uh, Jim Markham's book, Big Lucky. Uh, this man is uh, was a hairdresser. He was a barber and did all the celebrities in Hollywood like Steve McQueen and, and Paul Newman and Johnny Carson. And uh, anyway, he's become a, him and his wife have become dear friends. And uh, Big Lucky is just a wonderful business book. So if you want to know about business and about winning and about being authentic, read Big Lucky. But I sent that with him because he's, you know, into that type of read. It's a nonfiction book. But if I ever have any extra copies of your books, I try to share it with people that are traveling because they can take it to other countries and you just never know where it may go from there. So my biggest audience on... Um... Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, are you back? <laughs> hey, that was fun, right, Kathy? The, it, the it, it's thing. so <laughs> much fun. I knew it, they always are. They always are. Um, thank you, Kathy L. Murphy, and um, and it was great to spend time with you, Saborna. Yeah, um, yeah. More coming, right? More coming. Yeah, and uh, I hope that that trip that she wants to go on, you know. 
take all of us to India, that really materializes. I, I hope that will be a lot of fun. I and hope so. I cannot too. just wait to show, show you guys my country. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think yeah. she's coming did back you, on to say goodbye. I did. Here did we you go. hear that last part? I'm going to yeah. connect you with Tumbleweed Smith, who's a radio personality. He's on over 50 Texas radio stations. I just did a big show with him talking about the big launch for the Kathy L. Murphy. Uh, he spoke at my girlfriend weekend. He's been doing these radio programs for 55 years. Wow. And he is young. I mean, he is like full of energy, but uh, he does go down to Houston now and then. So I'm going to see if I can make that connection with you. His name is Tumbleweed Smith and he's a Texas icon, just like Willie Nelson and Kinky Friedman and Ann oh, Richards. Kinky just passed. Did you I know. Start? And Kinky was one of my authors and a friend of mine. And I did many and events with him. And it, I actually set up the Marion County uh, Kinky Friedman for governor headquarters at my shop and it was the biggest book signing I ever had was for Kinky Friedman when he was running for governor and um, we sold 300 books in two hours and he sold over ten thousand dollars worth of let's get kinky in the governor's mansion t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> which That's still just cracks me up yeah, Kiki Friedman and Kathy Murphy, if I could have ever seen you in one room. I've got a great picture. It's packed away, but I'll I'm going to have to get it out of, I think he had on his iconic cigar and cowboy hat and vest. And I think I had on my tiara, but it was in my shop, but we, he was a trip, man. He was a, a lot of fun. So uh, a really nice guy and a real animal activist. I really loved him. So I was really sad because, um, he was one of the good guys. But anyway, you guys have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your last Sunday night and then a beginning to a wonderful 4th of July week. Um, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this for me. And I will be sharing your story on all social media and be sure. And uh, I put it on LinkedIn, every, every one of my Facebook pages, Instagram, you know, threads, all of them. I, I put it everywhere. So to review it. Um, I was, I'm a little behind because of my TBR pile. And then I got the C disease and I know I have about 50 pages left and I will definitely send you the link. It'll be up on your page as long as soon as you approve it Kathy okay but send me the send me the books and I'll put it in the copy as soon as you can just one or two and I'll add it to the copy when I post that today so y'all have a great great Sunday and God bless you and uh it's till so next time it's all about the story bye Sabrina <laughs> bye Kathy I love you guys thank you so much bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.